afternoon. Uh, the first item of business this afternoon is a statement by Paul Wheelhouse on the review of underground coal gasification. The Minister will take questions at the end of his statement and there should therefore be no interventions or interruptions. Uh, Minister, I call you to start. 15 minutes, please. Presiding officer, this government is taking a clear and consistent approach to understanding the potential role for emerging technologies that could be used to further develop Scotland's hydrocarbon resources. That approach is one of caution while we gather and consider evidence on these new technologies. Presiding officer, this precautionary approach is the right approach and it is one that has been widely supported by communities, industry and other interested parties. I am aware there have been some recent examples of misunderstandings regarding the different technologies involved and I think it would be useful, uh, therefore, to take a moment to reiterate our position on unconventional oil and gas before I turn to the separate issue of underground coal gasification. On 28th of January 2015, this government put in place a moratorium on unconventional oil and gas, which means that no such activities can currently take place in Scotland. This moratorium covered hydraulic fracturing, or fracking as it is often referred to, and coal bed methane. This moratorium followed the publication of a comprehensive report by our independent expert uh, scientific panel on unconventional oil and gas. And I encourage members of this chamber to go back and look at this report to refresh their memories on its detail. That report recognised that while there was a considerable body of international research and evidence on unconventional oil and gas, there were gaps in key areas of evidence, including on climate change impacts, public health and decommissioning. The moratorium on unconventional oil and gas ensures that no fracking takes place while we explore these and other issues like traffic and economic impacts in detail before holding a full and comprehensive public consultation. I can confirm today that the independent projects we commissioned to examine underground un unconventional oil and gas in more depth are nearing completion. As was widely reported at the time, there were delays to commissioning the transport research project. Despite acting swiftly to resolve those issues, that sequence of events has had an inevitable effect on the timetable for completing and publishing our research. But I can assure the Chamber that the final project reports, which will form one of the world's uh, most wide-ranging investigations into unconventional oil and gas, will be published in full as soon as possible after recess. Presiding officer, as members are no doubt aware, there are strongly held views across Scotland on unconventional oil and gas and real, concern, uh, real concerns amongst communities. We must recognise, listen to and respond to these concerns. This is why the publication of the research reports will be followed by an extensive public consultation that will take place as planned in winter 2016-17. The consultation will give people across Scotland the opportunity to consider, scrutinise, debate and set out their views on these technologies and the evidence. Given the seriousness of the issue, this is the right and proper way to proceed. To make a decision now would be to deny the people of Scotland a voice on this crucial issue. And I now want to turn to a different technology, one that is also very much a matter of interest to communities across Scotland, particularly around the Firth of Forth. Underground coal gasification, or UCG for short, is a process for converting coal into gas while underground via combustion. The technology requires two wells to be drilled, an injection well through which gases are pumped to create high pressure combustion of the coal, and a production well through which the resultant syngas can be brought to the surface. Syngas is a mixture of gases, methane, hydrogen, carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide, which can be used as a fuel or as a feedstock for chemical products. Unlike hydraulic fracturing or coal bed methane, there are very few examples of this technology being used commercially anywhere in the world. In recent years, there has, however, been interest in deploying this technology in Scotland, and the UK government, through the Coal Authority, have issued coal mining licences for potential UCG sites in the Firth of Forth. I want to stress that no planning or environmental consents for UCG have been issued in Scotland. Planning and environmental protection are fully devolved matters, and both consents are necessary before a development could begin. On the 8th of October 2015, the Scottish Government put in place a specific moratorium on UCG, separate to the moratorium on unconventional oil and gas, using the planning powers available to the Scottish Government, so that evidence on this technology could be gathered and considered. To develop this evidence base, we asked Professor Campbell Gemmell, Professor of Environmental Research, Policy, uh, Regulation and Governance at the University of Glasgow, to undertake an independent examination of UCG. I would wish to advise members that Professor Gemmell's report has now been published. It's uh, copies at the rear of the chamber, I believe. Uh, and I would like to take this opportunity to thank Professor Gemmell for his work and for preparing a confident and comprehensive assessment of the technology. The report, which has been informed by literature and through in-depth interviews with academics, industry, NGOs, community groups and regulators, 
notes that there are substantial coal resources in Scotland that could potentially be exploited by UCG technologies with the greatest reserves of coal in central Scotland, Ayrshire, Clackmannanshire and East Fife. The commercial value of these reserves, if utilised for UCG development, would of course depend upon gas market prices and competition, the quality and volume of gas, consistency of throughput and other economic factors. On potential impacts from UCG, Professor Gemmell's report makes a number of observations which I believe raise serious concerns over the future of this industry in Scotland. Firstly, there are very few comprehensive or peer-reviewed studies examining environmental and health impacts. Where impacts have been documented, these have been from trials rather than from full commercial scale activity. Where the industry has operated, which is typically at a pilot or trial scale, there is emerging evidence of significant environmental impacts. This includes soil contamination and exposures of workers to toxins resulting from major operational failures. A number of failures in Australia have resulted in prosecutions being brought. Professor Gemmell also raises concerns that the current regulatory framework is insufficiently clear and would need to be improved to protect the environment, public health and workers' health and safety. Turning to the important issue of climate change, Professor Gemmell notes that UCG produces a variety of greenhouse gases, many without current viable market outlets. Professor Gemmell concludes that, and I quote, climate change and decarbonisation targets would be very seriously impacted by unmitigated releases of UCG greenhouse gases if operated at scale, making the achievement of current or stronger commitments much more difficult, if not impossible, unquote. This would particularly be the case where gas production is not combined with a suitable removal, storage, offset or compensation method, for example, carbon capture and storage. Professor Gemmel also concludes that a step change in the availability of robust data and science would need to take place before the technology could be reliably assessed. In Professor Gemmel's words, and I quote again, a very substantial transformation in available data is needed. In conclusion, Professor Gemmel states that, and I quote, it would be wise to consider an approach to UCG based upon a precautionary presumption, unquote, and, and it would appear logical, as he says again, in quote, to progress towards a ban, unquote. Presiding officer, having considered the report in detail, it is the Scottish Government's view that UCG poses numerous and serious environmental risks, and on that basis, the Scottish Government cannot support this technology. Accordingly, UCG will have no place in Scotland's energy mix at this time. I acknowledge the interest that there has been in this technology in Scotland. I am confident that any companies with an interest in UCG would aim to operate to the highest standards. I also acknowledge the shortage of reliable information that Professor Gemmell was able to identify and therefore grateful to him for the lengths he went to that ensured he reached out to a broad spectrum of interested parties and community groups both in Scotland and worldwide. I will therefore ensure there is sufficient opportunity for views and evidence to be brought forward and considered as we develop and consult on our energy strategy for Scotland which will set out an energy mix for the future that does not include underground coal gasification. Today I wrote to the Secretary of State for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy, setting out the Scottish Government's concerns. I have asked him not to grant any further licences for UG in, UG, UCG in Scotland, and I have also asked him to revoke all existing licences. I understand that UK Government are also considering their position on UCG, and an announcement is due shortly. I expect that the Conservative members in the Chamber may have sought to familiarise themselves with a position that is likely to emerge. However, Presiding Officer, it's a matter of great regret that this Parliament does not have the necessary powers over the licensing regime for UCG. The Scottish Government therefore intends to continue to use the planning powers available to us to ensure UCG applications do not receive planning or environmental permission. I cannot predict what kind of clean energy technologies may be available in the decades to come, but what is certain is that this coal resource will still be here. Uh, Presiding Officer, the position I have announced today on UCG is a clear validation of the evidence-based approach this government is taking. We live in a world where the pace and scale of technological innovation is increasing. This is a testament to our collective ingenuity and must be supported and embraced wherever possible. However, when necessary, Presiding Officer, we must be ready to pause so we can cons consider and interrogate the evidence and be ready to act accordingly, which I believe we have done today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister. The Minister will now take questions on the issues raised in his statement. I will intend to allow around 30 minutes for questions, after which we'll move on to the next item of business. It would be helpful if members who wish to ask a question were to press their request to be, speak buttons now. And I first of all call Alexander Burnett, and it be followed by Claudia Beamish. Mr Burnett. Uh, thank you, and can I thank the Minister for advance notice of his statement. Uh, I am, however, deeply disappointed, along with many oil workers trying to find re-employment in the stance the Scottish Government is taking on UCG today. 
Their position two weeks before conference is of no surprise and marks yet another missed SNP opportunity. It is evident that we must switch to a low carbon economy and UCG is certainly one of the fuels we can use to do this. It is perhaps a shocking indictment that their own expert, Professor Campbell Gemmell, writes in his report today, but whilst the regulatory framework is potentially adequate, it is, not, it, is, it is currently fragmented, insufficiently clear, but does not fit well together for the ease of use by the operator for the integrated protection of the environment or for the reassurance of the public. So would the minister agree that one of the main reasons this can't go ahead is because the regulatory framework in Scotland isn't good enough? Whose fault is that? Minister. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I think it's very interesting that Mr Burnett has changed his tone markedly from the, the uh, performance, if I can call it performance, in Good Morning Scotland uh, this morning, where when asked by the presenter, the Scottish Government has gone through a process here, a moratorium, an independent report. Is that not the right way forward, the right way to proceed? Mr Burnett said, I think so. But at the end of the day, when you have a report, you have to listen to the scientific advice you're given, and we don't believe the Scottish Government is doing that. What else are we doing other than listening yeah, to the yeah. scientific evidence that says this industry cannot safely be deployed in Scotland? And Mr Burnett's point about the oil industry, he cannot question seriously this Government's commitment to the oil and gas industry. We're doing extensive work through our oil and gas uh, jobs task force and, and also the work he is, I'm sure, aware of on the transition training fund to help workers from the oil and gas industry into alternative employment. We're doing everything we can, but to, to, to pick on an issue which he's obviously had to change, change his script since uh, presumably consulting his colleagues south of the border. Yeah. On this point uh, about the low carbon economy and the regulation, there is no point in having regulation put in place for an industry that is not going to be acceptable in terms of its impact on the environment and the scientific evidence proves that it is not acceptable at this time. Mr. Uh, Professor Gemmell has recommended we move towards a ban. Perhaps Mr. Burnett should listen to Professor Gemmell. Right. Claudia Beamish, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I thank the Minister for prior sight of the statement and Professor Gemmell's independent review into under underground coal gasification? This statement highlights concerns about, and I quote, toxic contam contamination and exposures of workers to toxins resulting from major operational failures and a great deal more. Concerns about climate change are also recognised in the statement and report. It is a welcome first step that Scottish Government intends, as, and I quote again, to continue to use the planning powers available to us to ensure that UCG applications do not receive planning uh, or environmental permission. And, and that's where that quote ends, and that UCG will not be included in the energy strategy. The report recognises the importance of the precautionary principle and states that it would appear, I quote again, logical to um, progress towards a ban. Surely, Minister, a similar precautionary principle applies to all forms of unconventional oil and gas extraction. The Parliament has already raised concerns about the unconventional oil and gas extraction. And will the Scottish Government now respect the will of the Scottish Parliament and introduce an outright ban immediately on all forms of unconventional gas extraction? Minister. Well, can I first of all welcome uh, Claudia Beamish's uh, welcome of, of the steps we have taken today. That's uh, po positive. I do understand the position the Labour Party have taken on this issue, and I'm not, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not challenging the right to do so. Uh, but I would just gently put it to, to Claudia Beamish and her colleagues in the Labour Party that we have proven today that we can take a sensible, precautionary approach. There is a moratorium in place which pre prevents any such activity of coal bed methane extraction or hydraulic fracturing happening in Scotland while we do the necessary science scientific research to understand the impacts of the industry. The expert panel revealed that there were some significant gaps, and I'm sure Claudia Beamish recognises those gaps that needed to be filled in our understanding, and we are going through that process. We will then, once we have published the reports, and I've set out today the rough timescale for that happening, we will I, I commit to a public consultation, an extensive public consultation, to allow the people of Scotland to have a say on this matter. And I think that's very, very important. The evidence that Professor Gemmell has set out is extremely clear in the case of this particular technology but they have two separate technologies and we try to deal with those separately uh, in the basis that we have set out to Parliament before and I repeat again today. So I give an undertaking to the member, we will take very seriously the scientific evidence that comes forward in those industries, but we'll also consult the public and give uh, stakeholders from environmental NGOs through to the industry and the wider public the chance to have a say on that evidence and to, to augment it where necessary or criticise it where they feel that's justified.
Uh, thank you. Angus MacDonald, followed by Murdo Fraser. Mr MacDonald. Thank you, President Officer. The vast majority of my constituents in Falkirk East will warmly welcome this decision on UCG by the, the Scottish Government. Clearly, opening up any new fronts in fossil fuel extraction is bad for the climate. Only this week we heard again about renewables achieving new records with the news from WWF Scotland that for two days in September wind power generated the equivalent of all Scotland's electricity needs for the day. Does the Minister agree with WWF and the Committee on Climate Change that we must build on our renewable electricity revolution and expand it to other sectors such as heat and transport? Minister. Well, I very much do agree with the sentiment behind Angus Macdonald's question. We have, uh, as, as I'm sure Mr Macdonald knows, the plan to publish a draft energy strategy by the early part of next year, by hopefully January next year, to coincide with the climate change plan uh, delivery of that. And the two strategies are very closely integrated, I'm sure he understands. We are seeking to have a balanced energy mix in Scotland, but it would be no secret that this government believes very strongly that our future relies in a low-carbon, decarbonised electricity generation system, and that is where we're putting a considerable amount of effort. So we will set out technology by technology what approach we believe we can take to pursue that low-carbon future and to support the growth of renewables. Uh, it's worth saying, uh, before I'm criticised by Conservative members opposite, that we have uh, very much a belief in the future of our oil and gas industry as well. as a traditional industry we have to achieve a low carbon future but uh, we know that oil and gas will be important for many years to come and will um, provide uh, feedstock for petrochemicals and other industries as well but I, I reassure the member we are taking uh, the development of our renewable energy industry uh, extremely seriously and we would challenge the UK government to back that industry with appropriate routes to market for onshore wind uh, tidal energy and other technologies to, and pumped hydro to make sure we can maximize the opportunities in Scotland. Murdo Fraser followed by John Mason. Mr Fraser. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Until recently, the Scottish Government's website said this. Alternative mining technologies, such as underground coal gasification, are attracting interest both globally and from a number of developers in Scotland. The Scottish Government are supportive of such innovative technologies, which offer the potential for a secure, economic and low-carbon energy store. Indeed, his predecessor, Fergus Ewing, said in April last year, we should never close our minds to the potential opportunities of new technologies. Does the Minister recognise the dismay of many in industry that the closed mind, the open mind rather, of Fergus Ewing has been replaced with his closed mind? Minister? Uh, well, uh, uh, I'd like to see Murdo Fraser being as charitable as he always is. Um, but what I would say in relation to, to the comments on the website, we have taken a genuinely technology neutral stance on this. We have looked at the technology we've commissioned. Indeed, my predecessor, Fergus Ewing, he accuses of being open mind, commissioned the very research I'm reporting on today, which concluded that this technology could not safely be deployed at this time in Scotland. And therefore, this government has uh, taken forward an energy strategy with no place for underground gold classification in our energy mix. I think that's a reasonable approach to take, having uh, Fergus Ewing having commissioned the research, and, and it's my duty to report on that research, uh, that the results have been uh, perhaps unappealing to Mr Fraser and his, and his predisposition towards uh, uh, fossil fuels. But I, I certainly would uh, challenge him, challenge him to, to, to challenge the research that Professor Gemmell has produced today, which is very conclusive about the risks that it poses to the environment and the health and safety of the workers involved. Let's not forget that. With the risk of underground explosions and explosions in the surface, we have to take account of these matters. And in this case, we have decided this is not an acceptable industry at this time in Scotland. But the resource will still be there, the coal will still be there, and if safe, clean technologies which do not damage the environment can come forward at some point in the future, it's still there to be exploited. Thank you, John Mason, followed by Claire Baker. Mr Mason. Thank you. The Minister referred to the energy strategy, and I wonder, can the Minister assure us, is he convinced that uh, we can ensure that we can generate the energy and the jobs that we want and need, we can allow poorer people to heat their homes, and we can still safeguard the environment? Can we get a balance between all of these? I, I would very much, um, presiding officer, very much ag agree with the, the, the point we can, I believe. We're taking a forward approach with our energy strategy, which is looking at a whole system approach to our energy use in Scotland and energy supply. We'll be looking at how we can reduce demand, crucially, as well as improving fuel, fuel poverty and helping individuals to have a more sustainable future and to, to help them with the financial implications of rising costs of energy, but also delivering on our climate change ambitions, which are about trying to ensure we meet our very ambitious targets, both for 2020 and indeed 2050. And as I'm sure the member is aware, the First Minister has signalled that we seek to, to increase the ambition of this government in terms of tackling climate change. So it makes it all the more important that we take into account the impact of an industry like this potentially on our climate change targets. And without the potential for mitigation through CCS or other approaches, 
That is another significant reason why we could not pursue this industry at this time. But I certainly give the member an assurance that uh, issues such as district heating uh, and, and heat mapping are very much in our, in our thoughts. And also taking forward uh, Scotland's energy efficiency programme as a national infrastructure project will allow us to tackle uh, fuel poverty and help reduce emissions from our domestic sector. Claire Baker to be followed by Joan McAlpine. Ms Baker. Um, President Officer, I first asked the Scottish Government to ban UCG in 2013 and I've been raising concerns about the issue ever since. Um, however, the previous Energy Secretary said it was not possible for the Scottish Government to rule out UCG and so I'm glad to see the current Energy Minister takes a very different view. And I want to commend him for taking the decision today to rule out UCG as part of Scotland's energy mix. Can I ask the Energy Minister if he's planning to issue revised and appropriate planning guidance to local authorities on the back of today's decision? Minister. Um, well, of course, issues to do with planning policy would be a matter for, for the, the relevant minister. It's not, not my gift to do that, but I'll certainly make sure that that point is raised with, with my colleagues. However, I would, I would say that by making a firm statement in our energy strategy and also making it clear we are not going to issue any uh, planning permissions or, or indeed environmental consents licensing, uh, that effectively takes, takes uh, uh, to us a position where it would be impractical for a project to be developed in Scotland. We have legal constraints on us. The licensing is still undertaken by the UK government and we've, we've made an appeal today through the letter I've sent to uh, Greg Clark, the Secretary of State, for those licenses that are already um, in existence to be uh, revoked and for new licenses to be prevented uh, to respect the, the decision we've made today. Um, but obviously the matter of planning policy, I will, I'll make sure that point is raised with my colleagues. Joan McAlpine to be followed by Maurice Golden. Ms McAlpine. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I would also like to welcome the Minister's uh, statement. The UK Coal Authority has already issued licences for underground coal gasification beneath the Solway at Gretna. But I'm pleased to say that the company which received those licences has now abandoned its plans and folded. Does the announcement today mean that my constituents in the area can be reassured that underground coal gasification will not now take place under the Solway in the future? Minister. Uh, well, it's an important point. As I outlined in my statement, uh, this, this government intends to use its powers to block UCG activity in Scotland. Uh, so in answer to uh, jo uh, Joan McAlpine's point, I've, as I say, I've written to the Secretary of State for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy, making clear the Scottish Government's view that the UK Government should not issue further licences for UCG in Scotland and existing licences should be revoked. This would mean that no activity in relation to UCG can take place. But the licence in the Solway Firth is due to expire in December 2016. I understand that the licence holder, Five Quarter Energy Limited, has ceased trading in the UK and I trust these actions will reassure the member. Uh, thank you. Maurice Golden to be followed by Colin Beattie. Mr Golden. Uh, given that climate change is a global issue that requires global solutions, can the Minister assure this Chamber that this isn't a parochial decision by categorically stating that Scotland will not import gas obtained via this method now or in the future from anywhere else in the world? Minister? Well, I would, I would certainly encourage Mr Golden to have a conversation with Mr Fraser because there seems to be a bit of a dichotomy in the Conservative Party on the future of Grangemouth. On the one hand, a member praising uh, the, the importing of gas to Scotland to secure the future of Grangemouth, and on the other hand, a member criticising that approach. These are commercial decisions that are taken. These, these are commercial decisions taken by Ineos, which is a major employer. This government supports Grangemouth as a plant and, and recognises its important role in the local economy. But the, those matters are best left to the government. I would point out to the member that Jim Ratcliffe, uh, the appeal presiding officer for embarking from the seating position, perhaps Mr Fraser. I Fraser, thought you were tough enough, but Mr Fraser, you have had your seat. Jim Ratcliffe, the, uh, who, 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 who I'm sure Mr Golden will recognise as a key figure in, the, in, in Ineos, has said that Grangemouth has... Uh, at least 20 years of life in it with the, with the, with the importing of gas to Scotland from, from overseas. And that is a commercial decision the company have taken. Thank you, Colin Beattie, to be followed by Mark Ruskell. Mr Beattie. Does the Minister share my astonishment that the Scottish Government has repeatedly been criticised by the Tories for taking advice from a wide range of independent experts, pledging to publish that advice in full and promising to give the people of Scotland a chance to make their views heard? Minister. 
Absolutely, um, I, I do. And uh, we've been consistently clear in our position uh, on, this, on this unconventional oil and gas, the only political party uh, to be so. And I disagree with Michael Gove, a colleague of the Conservatives, of course, who on Brexit said, people in this country have had enough of experts. Look where that got Michael Gove. And uh, perhaps not, uh, we, maybe the country would not be in a, such a big mess in terms of the impact of Brexit likely to, likely to fall on us if Conservative ministers, and at the time as he was Conservative minister, had listened more to the experts. We believe the people of Scotland, importantly, are smart enough to see the value of seeking out evidence and interrogating it before coming to a decision. And we are committed to allowing the public to have their say on this crucial issue. And I would challenge the Conservatives as to why they're afraid to listen to the views of the people of Scotland on these important technologies and to hear their, their thoughts on the future of this technology. Thank you, Colin Mark Ruskell, followed by Claire Adamson. Mr. Thank Ruskell, you, please. Presiding Officer. And can I warmly welcome this report and its conclusions? It not only validates a robust science-led approach, it validates the concerns of communities around the Firth of Forth and Solway and across Scotland. Concerns that have been rubbished by an aggressive industry over many years are now endorsed by this Parliament. Their voices have been heard. But can I ask the Minister, now you have identified the use of planning powers as the route to a permanent ban, then when will the Scottish Government make amendments to the Scottish planning policy and the national planning framework to embed this into policy in a way which is legally watertight? I hear your answer to Claire Baker in relation to embedding this into the energy strategy, and I also note you, know, you wrote to Heads of Planning in 2015, but I don't think that's enough. You need to explain how you're going to embed this into planning policy. Minister. Well, uh, there's a, it's a very important question, and I recognise the point that was made by Claire Baker in the same, same regard. I think what I have to highlight is this: uh, the government has announced its policy decision on the future of UCG today. We have committed, and I've mentioned it in my statement, we will undertake an SEA, Strategic Environmental Assessment, as part of our energy strategy, where we will set out we are not supporting this technology. We have to wait, obviously, for, for that to be concluded, but we are very clear about our position, but we have to go through due process. Uh, once we have that, uh, that, that, that position concluded, the energy strategy obviously has relevance in relation to planning decisions and planning matters, but I will take forward the point that, that Mr Ruskell and indeed Claire Baker have made today and make sure we can give clarity to both members on that point and any other members interested in this issue. Thank you, Claire Adamson, to be followed by Jackie Bailey. Ms Adamson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. As has already been mentioned by Mr Ruskell and Mr MacDonald, I am sure that communities on both sides of the fourth will be relieved to hear the Minister provide such clear assurance on underground coal gasification and his willingness to let the people of Scotland's voice be heard. Can the Minister give assurance that the views of the people of Scotland will be taken fully into account when also considering hydraulic fracturing or fracking should this happen in Scotland? Minister. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Our, our consultation on uh, unconventional oil and gas, which will take place on schedule this winter 2016-17, will, I, I, I promise, be a comprehensive exercise which will take on board a range of views, not only from the public, but will allow scientific, scientific evidence to be presented both for or against uh, relevant technology. But we will give everyone who has an interest in this issue an opportunity to express their view. And uh, consultation with the people of Scotland will be a key element of uh, our understanding the issues around the future of both technologies. And I give a commitment to the member that will be very listening, very, listening very carefully uh, to the views of the people of Scotland. Thank you, Jackie Bailey, if you're followed by Willie Coffey, Ms Bailey. Can I welcome the Minister's announcement today, which I believe recognises the very significant risk to both the environment, communities and workers from UCG. But can the Minister tell us what preparations he has undertaken should there be a legal challenge? And what is his expected timeline for a response from the UK government confirming that they will revoke these licences? Minister. Um, well, I don't want to be churlish about the UK government, but my expectations about timing of replies is, is, is coloured by the, the, the low, slow pace of replies to me on other matters. But we'll obviously, I'm sure it's a high profile matter, indeed with the, the due uh, support, I'm sure, of the Conservative members to seek clarity on the issue, I'm sure we can, we can get a quick reply for, from Mr Clark. But I, I do um, want to highlight that we obviously have going, going through what we believe is a due process, the, the evidence gathering the, uh, by Campbell Gemmell has been very thorough, we have read the report, we've come to a decision as to the future of the technology. Our, our suggested approach, given that we're not proposing to actually bring in a technology, is to just make that clear in the energy strategy and to take that forward through the strategic environmental assessment associated with the energy strategy, give uh, potential uh, 
route for people who've who want to complain about this approach being taken to, to make their views known. And we're, we believe we're following due process in that regard. Once the energy strategy uh, is indeed adopted and finalised, then that position would be, would be ratified, uh, assuming that there's no uh, showstoppers in the, in the SEA process itself. But we believe that is the correct due process to follow in this case. But I'm happy to keep the member informed as we, as we undertake that journey. Uh, thank you. Uh, Willie Coffey to be followed by Liam Smith. Mr Coffey. Thank you, President Officer. There appears to have been some confusion amongst some Tory MSPs recently about the difference between underground coal gasification or UCG and fracking. Does the Minister share my hope that the forthcoming publication of the expert reports on unconventional oil and gas will lead to a better informed debate in this chamber and across the country? We have time in hand, Minister. You can give a very fulsome response. <laughs> We've just got Miss Smith to come next. Oh, I will ha happily do so, uh, Presiding Officer. I think, I think it is an important point. I mean, we, we have seen quite a lot of confusion, both in the media and, the, uh, and indeed in, in the Chamber, from some, some quarters around the different technologies. We do, as that's why I've taken some uh, time today in my statement to try and make clear the differences between the technologies and the fact we've got different procedures in place to try and uh, make sure we take forward the scientific uh, evidence gathering for technologies. Clearly, in the case of the work that was done by the expert panel on unconventional oil and gas, there were some significant issues that needed to be addressed in terms of the uh, health impact, uh, decommissioning issues and climate change impacts, and that has required us to go through a journey of commissioning reports and uh, receiving those. I've yet to see them myself, but I will see them in, in the near future and will be able to report back to Parliament on the, uh, on, on the nature of the, the findings there. But in the case of underground coal gasification, we were able to take forward this exercise separately through Professor Campbell Gemmell. It's fair to say there's far less evidence internationally of its deployment, certainly, as I said in my statement, or anything other than a trial basis or a pilot basis. And therefore, uh, we're able to come to a, uh, quite a clear conclusion from the basis of the analysis that Professor Gemmell's presented to us. Uh, but I do take Mr Coffey's point entirely that this process will hopefully help, once we publish the reports, educate uh, uh, members across the chamber as to the differences between the technologies, but crucially inform the public and then invite the public to give their view on the future of the technologies. Having said I have time in hand, I now have an additional two speakers, which I don't mind at all. Elaine Smith to be followed by Graham Simpson and to be followed by Liam MacArthur. In that order, please. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, can I welcome the government's decision to stop UCG based on Professor Gemmell's review. I note the Minister in the statement also mentions fracking, which is of concern to many constituents in Central Region, and of course, this Parliament did, uh, President Officer, vote to ban it. Is the Minister, like me, concerned that fracking has been given the go ahead in Lancashire today, particularly given the previous earth tremors in Blackpool? When will the Minister's consultation on fracking close, and when can we then expect a government decision? Minister. Well, um, on, the, on the first point around the decision in Lancashire, that's obviously a matter for the U UK government. I, uh, I would merely contrast the approach we've taken to date in trying to look at scientific evidence and then reach a, a considered conclusion in respect of this technology and the approach we are taking in regards to uh, hydraulic fracturing or fracking and coal bed methane, where we will be taking forward scientific evidence and then consulting the public on their view. Uh, I dare say that the, the, the uh, uh, community in Langish, Lancashire that's been affected may not have been fully consulted in the process. On the issues about timing of, of the reports, uh, what I'm trying to work, we've consulted with uh, all the stakeholders in regards to this, in terms of the industry, the communities, and the NGO community around our thinking on this, but we're going to try and avoid a position where we compress consultation due to the Christmas period. So we are going to try and choose the timing carefully so that people have a, as long a period as possible to submit their views, and we are going to try and be proactive in engaging uh, community councils and, and other stakeholders to try and make sure that we give an open access to this as we possibly can and use existing government portals to also promote the uh, consultation online. So we are, I assure the member, doing what we can to prepare for a thorough consultation, the expectation there's going to be a lot of interest in this consultation from across the country, not just in the communities affected, and to ensure uh, that, that we take on board all views as best we can. Uh, so we will keep the chamber informed about timing, I, I assure the member, and uh, we'll do our best to make sure that uh, uh, nobody is unaware of the consultation itself. Thank you, Graham Simpson, to follow by Liam MacArthur. Mr. Simpson. Thank you. It's really um, it's a, it's a practical question for the Minister uh, around planning, because um, I wasn't really sure um, about his answers. Um, if an application was to come before a local authority and they were minded to grant it, uh, and they did grant it, 
what would be the government's response to that? Minister. Well, I, I, I'll put on record, perhaps, presiding officer, what our position is regarding this, just so that it helps members. We appreciate Mr Simpson's the third member to ask a very similar question around the, the, the certainty we can give. Um, clearly, we're saying today the Scottish Government does not support the development of a UCG industry in Scotland. As I've said in response to the second question that was raised uh, uh, recently, the forthcoming energy strategy will set out an energy mix for the future, and it is the Scottish Government's preferred position that underground coal gasification should have no place in those plans. Uh, we have written, as I say, to, on the issue of our licences to uh, Greg Clark today, uh, and hope that that uh, is progressed um, as quickly as is possible to uh, not only prevent new licences, which would then remove the need to even consider planning issues if there's no licences being presented, and also to revoke the existing licences so there's no existing planning issues to resolve either. So in the absence of any licences being issued, there is no need for the government to deal with with any planning applications, clearly. But no planning or environmental consents for UCG have been issued in Scotland. These are fully devolved matters and both consents are necessary before a development can begin. And the Scottish Government will continue to use such power to prevent UCG in Scotland. But I do take the point, we'll come to the Chamber uh, through, through SPICE or other means, we'll make sure that members are, are briefed on exactly the approach we take to, to stop that happening. Lee MacArthur, you will be the last questioner. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. I thought it would be helpful perhaps to allow colleagues participating in the next debate a little more time to get to the Chamber. But can I start by thanking uh, the Minister for advancing... I've handled that already. <laughs> Well, can I, 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 I never had any doubt, Deputy President Officer. Can I thank the Minister for advance sight of the, the statement and very much welcome uh, both the decision that he's announced today but also put on record uh, my thanks to Campbell Gemmell and, and colleagues for the um, very uh, arduous work that they've done over uh, a number of months in coming forward with what I think is a very helpful uh, report for the Parliament. Um, the Minister, in response, I think, to Elaine Smith, went into a little bit more detail about the consultation in relation to fracking. I understand why he might not necessarily be able to put a time frame on it. But he can, can he perhaps explain what, if any, weighting will be given to the responses that come through in that consultation, as he's already acknowledged um, views are very polarised on this issue. And I think the concern may be that this is somehow just a numbers game or, or that in, the, in, a, in a sense that the consultation may almost be prejudged. So I think any uh, advice he can offer on the way that consultation will be handled and submissions uh, to that consultation will be handled, I think would be very helpful. Minister. I'm happy to address that. We will, as I said earlier, we'll certainly commit, we'll give, give more detail as, as we can uh, to, to colleagues across the chamber as soon as we possibly can on this. But the general principle, is it just going to be a numbers game? I, I, I don't think so. I don't think that would be appropriate, but we will obviously take account of the strength of support or opposition um, to, to the technology. That is an important dimension amongst the communities that may be most affected by this, clearly. But also, we do have to look at the merits of the arguments, both for and against, and try and take a considered view. So I, I don't want to prejudge how we will do it, but we will give as much clarity so that those taking part in the consultation process know how they can best contribute and how they can best have an impact on the process, uh, taking into account the quality uh, and uh, the, the, you know, the, the detail that's supplied. Obviously, we are expecting that there will be a mixture of individual responses from a large number of people who are pro or, or anti the industry, uh, but also there will be opportunities for those in environmental NGOs and the industry itself to submit uh, evidence that they believe is pertinent to the, to the case for or against. Uh, so we're trying to, as I said earlier, be as open as possible and to allow as many people who wish to take part in the exercise to do so. It will have resource implications and so therefore it's difficult to be precise about the timing of publication, uh, but we're trying to do this in the context of delivering our energy strategy. So I think Mr, uh, Mr. MacArthur is aware of the timescales for that. Thank you. That concludes questions on that statement. And I'll, before we move on to the next item of business, allow the front benches to change over. Thank you very much.